Um, here in Nursing 102, we really don't spend a lot of time on cancer. Um, we really just want to kind of get into um, some of the basics. Uh, as you progress through the program and you start to get into your complex med surge class, uh, classes, you um, you will get you will dive a little bit further into cancer, talking about the specific types and things like that. Um, one big thing about cancer is we tend to know quite a bit about it just because uh, a lot of people, I guess, are affected by it. Um, I'm sure most everybody listening has had um, some kind of personal impact um, in their life because of cancer. Uh, someone close to them, a friend of them, uh, someone they knew. Uh, so there's a, a lot of aspects to cancer and, um, and how it affects people around us. which really is true of any kind of chronic disease, but I think cancer really gets a lot of attention. There's a lot of money poured into it, a lot of research that goes into it. Um, so we really hear a lot about it and it's just devastating because it really has um, no boundaries. It affects anybody. It doesn't discriminate. We're talking about um, children um, all the way to very elderly people, um, individuals who are otherwise healthy for no reason whatsoever. Um, will get cancer, um, uh, and it's just um, a, a completely devastating disease. Um, wh what part of what makes it such a pain, I guess, um, in the rear end is that cancer cells are, is, they're human cells, essentially. Um, what makes them different from normal, healthy human cells is they don't have a specific function. Um, they're just out there and they're growing and they're not really carrying out what it is they're supposed to do. So for example, you're, um, you have cells that make up the tissue that makes up the organ of the liver, right? All of those cells within that tissue and ultimately that organ serve some kind of purpose. They have a specific function. When we talk about cancer cells, those cells don't have any type of function. They're just kind of useless uh, laying out there. Um, there's no adherence, um, no contact inhibition, they have an unpredictable growth pattern, and they don't know when to die. So what does all of this actually mean? Um, normally when cells grow, they multiply in a certain pattern. Um, when they feel like they're starting to kind of run out of room to grow, they stop growing. Um, Cancer cells don't do that. They just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. That's why with some types of cancers, um, we will even be able to palpate a, a, a mass uh, because the cells have gone out of, uh, gone out of control with their growth. Um, they may not grow the same way. Um, the cells may not look completely the same. They are, we already know they don't have a specific function, but they also might not look like the original cell. In fact, the more that cells, um, you, you know, um, reproduce and uh, make more, um, the less like the original parent cell they look, and so the less like the original function it is they have. Um, another uh, good thing about cells, uh, normal healthy human cells, is that if they're dysfunctional, or um, there's something wrong with the DNA, or there's something wrong with the way that it's functioning, it knows when to die. It, that's called apoptosis. So it, it, the cell dies when it's supposed to die, or if it gets too old, right, um, and it's time for it to go, it knows when to die. But again, cancer cells, they don't have those types of characteristics. Um, because they are human cells, right, they're human cells kind of gone wild, I guess, um, that's part of what makes treating cancer so difficult because cancer cells are human cells. And when we're targeting our treatment, um, chemotherapies, radiations, things like that, towards cells that are human cells, we can't differentiate between healthy human cells and non-healthy human cells. And that's the crux of the matter, right? That's why we have so many complications um, uh, when we're undergoing cancer treatments because it, the, the treatment cannot differentiate between healthy um, and non-healthy. 
So what actually causes cancer? Um, we don't always 100% know. We oftentimes have a good indication. So we might say if you smoke, for example, um, you have a higher risk of developing cancer. Those carcinogens, right, those um, toxins that our cells are exposed to lead to alterations in the way that the cell um, reproduces and, and functions. It breaks down and starts to jack it up a little bit. Um, so it, we know that that can cause cancer, but we also know that sometimes people who have smoked never get cancer. Um, so part of it is genetic. Um, that's the element that we really, you can't change, right? That's a non-modifiable risk factor, your genes. Um, so we know there's that element of it. Uh, for example, we know that uh, a woman who has a family member, like a first degree family member that with a history of breast cancer, their likelihood of developing breast cancer themselves is, you know, astronomically greater than someone who has no family history of breast cancer. So there's that genetic component. Um, we also know that just because someone has a family member who had cancer doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to get it or develop it, I guess you don't really get cancer, you kind of develop it, it's not something that's contagious, but um, there's that modifiable risk factors that play a component into that. So we might have environmental um, exposure to some type of carcinogen or toxin that's gonna degrade or denature proteins within a cell and lead to alterations in the way that the cell um, functions or grows or whatever, and it starts to, get out of control. Um, you know, think about people who live in very industrial nations or cities. Um, people who um, are exposed to toxins maybe at their place of work. Um, people who um, maybe use particular types of drugs. Um, people that smoke, um, all of these things we know can can be a potential carcinogen that could turn on um, an oncogene and thus lead to the development of, of cancer. Um, our immune system also plays a role in the development of cancer. Um, our immune system will actually get rid of cells that are not healthy. Um, however, the older that we get, the less responsive our immune system becomes just naturally. Things like our thymus shrinks, which is where some of our immune cells come from. We have a higher risk of having multiple comorbidities or diseases, and so our, our immune system can't fight off things like it normally kids can. So older individuals tend to be more likely to develop cancer. So when we think about this question that you see up here, what causes cancer, we have a good idea of things that potentially can predispose a person to cancer, um, even though we know that it doesn't always lead to cancer 100% of the time. Um, so the way that we deal with that then is through prevention, preventative measures, right? The best way to deal with cancer is through prevention. Uh, we have what's called primary prevention and secondary prevention um, that we're gonna talk about here. Primary prevention is preventing the actual occurrence of cancer. So that's things like avoiding smoking. Right, if we know that cigarette smoking increases the risk of, of cancer, then let's just not do it at all. Avoidance of alcohol. Um, sun exposure, right? Skin cancer is caused directly uh, by overexposure to, um, to the sun, the UV and rays in the sun. So we use preventative measures when we are out in the sun. Um, vaccinations, we have learned that, um, oh gosh, we encourage the administration of the HPV vaccine to our young women because We've learned that HPV can lead to uh, cervical cancer. And so if we vaccinate against this um, human papillomavirus and our, our, our women don't get the HPV, then they are less likely to develop um, cervical cancer. So that's another primary preventative 
um, thing. Safe sex, kind of along the same uh, sort of lines there, right? We know that there are some diseases that can lead uh, potentially to cancer. Um, exercise is always important just to keep the body healthy, um, that kind of thing. But ultimately what a primary prevention does is we're just, we're just doing everything we can to prevent cancer from occurring. Um, this is where a lot of like public education programs come into place, um, public health, um, healthy people 2020 or healthy people, whatever year you want to, you know, talk about, there's going to be a new one coming out soon. Um, if not already, but anyway, I digress. Anyway, the primary is we're preventing the actual occurrence of cancer, whereas secondary is we're screening for early detection. So we've recognized that a person might be at risk. Oftentimes it's um, lifestyle or behaviors um, as well as, uh, or, or age, right? We know that, like I said earlier, the uh, increased age uh, leads to increased risk for development of cancers. Um, so we screen. Um, that's why women of the age of 40 and over will um, get screening for mammograms. It gives us a baseline, right? Even if a woman's not experiencing any type of problems, um, we get that baseline. Um, we know that not all breast lumps are palpable. Uh, in the early stages of breast cancer, so we go ahead and screen for it. Colonoscopies, for example, um, uh, people, age, I think age 50 is the colonoscopy cutoff. When you reach that age, you should get a colonoscopy um, to look for things like polyps and that kind of thing, again, to get a, a baseline. Uh, we encourage breast self-examination, um, pap smears to our young women, I think starts at age 21. Um, so different things like that. We're not diet, we're not, um, uh, we're not preventing a cancer from occurring. We just know um, that at a certain point in time or with a certain risk factor or um, a certain gender that someone is more likely to develop a cancer. And so we screen for it so that we can detect it early and catch it early. Um, prostate cancer might be another one. Men get PSA and maybe uh, digital rectal examinations for um, checking for prostate cancer. So there are a lot of them out there. Now we don't screen for every type of cancer. Um, for example, we don't routinely screen people for, um, for lung cancer. It's just not, not something that we do. Now, if a patient has a high risk factor for development of lung cancer, let's say they're older, maybe they've smoked since they were six, they're starting to develop symptoms of like shortness of breath, then yeah, maybe we might um, get a chest x-ray or something uh, of that nature, but we don't routinely screen people um, for something like that. So not all types of cancers have screening, um, but some of them do. And so we implement that when we can. There is also an additional kind of prevention um, called tertiary prevention. And tertiary prevention, I'm not going to really spend much any time on that, really. Um, but um, tertiary prevention focuses on reducing the uh, morbidity and mortality once a person is already diagnosed with, with cancer. So prolonging life and health and longevity and that kind of thing. Um, I would like to just real quickly side note, introduce you to my family. Um, I have three boys that live in the house, one of whom my husband is incredibly loud when he talks and has absolutely no um, attention, pays absolutely no attention to anything that's going on around him. So I could be very deep into a serious conversation or lecture and he will continue to yell about whatever it is. He's not yelling in anger. He is just a very loud human being and doesn't know when to stop talking. Um, also, a son of mine, my youngest one, one that just turned 15, likes to play the guitar. So every now and then you will hear him playing in the background perhaps. Also, I have another son who will be 17 soon. Um, and he likes to play video games with his stupid little headphones on and you might hear him scream in the background. I don't know what they're yelling about. They just yell at one another playing these dumb games. I don't even know what they're into now, but um, I just want to assure everybody that everyone in this household is safe and sound um, and we are all fine. I just um, live with some loud individuals. So I just mentioned that because I don't know what my husband's talking about right now, but he's really loud and you might be able to hear him. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. Sorry about that. 
Okay, warning signs and symptoms. There are lots of different warning signs and symptoms of cancer that could be very system specific. Um, but generally speaking, especially when we wanna educate the general public about when you need to go to a doctor and maybe report that something, hey, something might be going on and perhaps you should check me out a little bit. We like to use this acronym of CAUTION. This is a really good comprehensive way um, to teach the public on things that they need to monitor for and report changes to, uh, to their provider. So a change in bowel or bladder habits, um, a sore that does not heal, any unusual bleeding or discharge, that could be rectal or vaginal, um, nipple, um, I don't know, penile discharge, I don't know, anything. Um, any kind of thickening of tissue or lump that is palpated, um, indigestion or difficulty swallowing, any obvious changes in a wart or a mole or nagging cough and hoarseness. So this is a really good um, you know, educational acronym uh, for, for, the, for the public. And it's a really great way for students such as yourself to remember uh, some of those things uh, as you're looking at different test questions. And remember these are very general, right? So if you're looking at a situation, like a patient situation where, I don't know, a patient tells you that they've been um, peeing more than they have been like just over the last couple of weeks and they feel like they always have to go, well, that's a change in bladder habits, right? Or if they've been having a lot of heartburn over the last, you know, three months and, you know, it just doesn't seem to be getting any better, even though they're doing stuff about it, that's, you know, indigestion. So someone's not going to come up to you and say, I have a sore that does not heal. This is just a guideline for you to kind of lump things into it as patients report different complaints or problems to you. Uh, so what do we do for cancer? What kind of treatments can we do? Well, there are quite a few and actually treatment types are growing. Um, I am not an oncology nurse by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I've cared for patients who have had cancer, who have had, been experiencing medical surgical issues, um, but I don't get into chemotherapy. Actually, um, Oncology nurses who administer chemotherapy are certified to be able to do so. Um, we'll just go ahead and start with that. So chemotherapy, this is probably what a lot of individuals think of when they think of cancer. And chemotherapy technically is called anti-neoplastic therapy, right? And this is a pharmacological intervention that we're going to do. It helps to kill the cancer cells. Now, remember, it's targeting cells that are rapidly dividing because that's what cancer does. Cancer typically is a rapidly dividing cell. So when we think about chemotherapy, same thing with radiation, when we think about these types of treatments and the types of cells they're targeting, some of the side effects that we're going to see with chemotherapy are going to be those that affect other cells in the body that rapidly divide. And those types of cells are things like hair follicles, right, the hair cells, or um, the uh, oral mucosa, right? Those cells inside the mouth, they divide rapidly. Skin cells divide rapidly. Um, intestinal lining cells, they divide rapidly, right? Because these cells are constantly exposed to things. They're dying off. They're regenerating. So when a patient is um, receiving chemotherapy, they're likely to have um, side effects that are related to that issue. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the only type of side effects that chemotherapy can cause. There's a wide array of side effects related to a variety of different chemotherapies, but just generally speaking, those are the types of cells um, that are being damaged. So it's non-specific. They can't specifically target those um, cancer cells, right? They're going to be damaging and killing healthy cells as well. Um, chemotherapy is used to help prevent uh, metastases, right? Metastases occurs when a, 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 a cluster of cancer cells begins to break off into the bloodstream and then travel or into the lymphatic system and then travel and then seed itself somewhere else in the body, right? We don't want it to metastasize, um, but that, that's what that means. So when somebody says they have um, like breast cancer that metastasized to the brain, that means when they find a tumor in the brain, 
if they were to biopsy that and look at those cells under a microscope, they would be breast tissue cells, not brain cells, right? Because those breast cells are um, uh, uh, breaking off and traveling and then seeding elsewhere. So there's that. Um, surgery. Let's see, surgery can be prophylactic. Um, I, there's been in the news, and I've been looking at pictures uh, lately, um, looking into like uh, women who are at high risk for breast cancer um, are prophylactically having their breast tissue removed so that they then don't develop the breast cancer, right? If you don't have the tissue, you can't develop the cancer in it. It could be, uh, surgeries could be curative, meaning we go in, uh, we find the tumor, it's completely encapsulated, we take it out, there's no um, type of cancer cells, it's got clean borders, we take it out and the cancer then is cured. It might be palliative, um, perhaps there is some type of tumor that um, is pushing up against something, maybe it's pushing up uh, against a blood vessel or compressing tissue in the brain or something of that kind of nature. And there is, you know, there's no way we're going to be able to cure the cancer or the likelihood that cancer is be, going to be cured is going to occur, uh, is not going to occur. I don't have any idea what I just said, um, but what I'm getting at is palliative surgery is just to remove a tumor to make a patient more comfortable. It's not going to fix or get rid of the cancer. Um, we can also use it to help can, surgery to help control like the size of, of the cancer that's going on there. Um, radiation is used to uh, kill cancer cells, control the growth of cancer cells, and also relieve some of the symptoms. With radiation treatment, we are shooting a beam. Uh, I mean, there's multiple different types, but um, essentially we're irradiating part of the body. And with radiation, what happens is it denatures the proteins within the cell, causing them to die. And again, it doesn't always affect just the cancer cells. It can also affect normal healthy cells. That's one thing. Another thing is if we're using um, like a teletherapy where we're blasting a beam through like let's say the chest wall into the lung, right, to irradiate a tumor there, that has to go in through um, the skin. And so there's potential for damage to occur to that skin. So things that we have to consider when a patient has had radiation is good skin care, right? We have to make sure that they um, are not using harsh chemicals or lotions on that skin, that they're avoiding sun exposure, um, you know, because of photosensitivity and damage to that skin because of the radiation. Radiation can also cause severe fatigue, especially two to three days after the treatment. They may go get treatment, feel really well, and then a few days later start to feel very fatigued. In fact, that fatigue can last a long time, months to years, I've been reading in your book, um, that fatigue associated with radiation. So things that we need to consider when we're implementing nursing care for patients undergoing radiation treatment. Um, a lot of these other ones, the immunotherapy, hormone therapy, gene therapy, stem cell transplant, I'm not going to go into all of these. Like I said, we're just kind of scratching the surface. There's a lot of research out there about um, these different types of treatment. There's a lot of success with these different types of treatment. I don't expect you to know how all of these things work. I'm just putting them out there for your reference so you know that there are things happening in cancer treatment and cancer care. Um, and you can stay abreast of those or as up to date on those as you would like to as you decide what kind of nurse um, you are going to be when you graduate from nursing school. Um, okay, so what do we do for patients when they have problems related to the treatment um, that they are getting? We kind of have already talked a little bit about radiation, right? Like limiting sun exposure, protecting that skin, not using harsh chemicals, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but what about the medication that we are administering as nurses, right? Um, there are some medications that are... Um, antineoplastic therapies. For example, methotrexate is a medication we use um, for the treatment of things other than cancer. And so you might see that medication administered on a medical surgical unit. You don't have to be a specific oncology nurse to give it, but you do need to be aware of handling precautions. This is why those 
medications, especially the intravenous medications that are being administered to these patients require special certification. We are instilling poison into a person's body so that it is meant to kill cells within that body. Um, nurses have to use very special personal protective equipment when handling and administering these medications beyond what you guys have learned um, in terms of basic PPE, different types of gloves, different types of gowns, masks, goggles, you know, I mean the whole uh, nine yards. Uh, they do not want this medication getting on them. That really says a lot, doesn't it? When you're thinking about, you know, well, this is going into the patient. Something to consider also uh, when we talked about infusions or as you have learned about infusions, one of the things we learned was a word called infiltration. And if you recall, when we were talking about infiltration, it, that was something that occurred when a patient who had an IV fluid infusing into their vein, for whatever reason, the fluid started to infuse into the tissue around the vein. Maybe the IV came out, maybe the vein blew, maybe who, who knows what happened. But the fluid was then infusing into the tissue around the vessel. Um, the tissue maybe looked um, translucent, maybe cooler than the tissue, uh, the other tissue. Um, edematous, patient might complain of pain, right? It, it, should, it, should, be, it, should, be, it should be sounding be what we would call an infiltration of an IV, right? Oftentimes medications um, or IV fluids like normal saline might infiltrate and the body will just reabsorb it, it'll be just fine. Um, other times medications, if they infiltrate into that tissue, they can be very damaging. In fact, we like to use the word extravasation when a medication that's caustic to the tissue or damaging to the tissue infiltrates into the tissue around the vein because of an IV that's not functioning the way that it should be. Um, when a patient has uh, is receiving uh, antineoplastic therapy, if that medication infiltrates into the tissue around their IV, it can be very, it can kill that tissue, cause tissue necrosis and death. Um, so we have to make sure that we have good IVs. Now, some patients might go in and get um, a peripheral IV placed uh, for antineoplastic therapy. Um, other patients go in and they're, they know that they're going to have this treatment for a long time, several weeks to months, and they go ahead and they have some type of central line place. It reduces those types of risks of infiltration um, and it can handle the medications a little bit better. They don't have to get stuck um, so many times. Uh, chemotherapy is hard on, on the systemic vasculature. Um, so things to consider in terms of medication uh, handling. Nausea and vomiting is a very common complaint with chemotherapy, uh, radiation. Um, patients can we can do a lot of things for nausea and vomiting. We can, of course, give medications called antiemetics. This would be medications like um, ondansetron, also known as Zofran, or promethazine, also known as Phenergan. Uh, let's see, what's another one? Compazine. Uh, I can't remember the generic name. You can Google it. Compazine is another one. Ondansetron slash Zofran, that is probably one that is the most common. Your book definitely talks about lots of other things, but we can do pharmacological interventions for nausea and vomiting. We can also do non-pharmacological interventions. We can limit the, the um, presence of like very smelly things, right? So really smelly foods. Have you ever felt sick to your stomach and then someone brought in like White Castle and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to lose it, right? Um, so we can be careful about things uh, like odors. Um, bland foods, uh, foods that aren't going to be spicy or really upsetting to the stomach. Um, also with vomiting, um, you know, we have to be careful with a risk for dehydration or uh, hypovolemia, right? We need to make sure that our patients are staying nice and hydrated, especially if they're vomiting excessively. So something else for you to consider there. Um, mucositis, I don't know why I have this starred. It's not any more important than any of the other ones. 
it just didn't get edited out, I guess. Um, when I talked about how the cells inside the uh, mouth, uh, that the oral mucosa breaks down um, or, or re, uh, you know, turns over very quickly, we can end up with sores in the mouth. And just think about this. If you have sores in your mouth, what is that going to be like? It's going to be uncomfortable to eat, to drink, to brush your teeth. Um, your mouth, mouth might feel dry. Um, just your tongue moving around in your mouth could be uncomfortable. So we're going to want to provide frequent oral care for these patients. Um, maybe like um, moist mouth swabs, um, non-alcohol based um, uh, like mouthwashes, um, maybe ice chips, uh, you know, that might be comforting to the patient. So um, soft foods, right? We're not going to want to eat potato chips and Doritos and stuff like that. Um, things like applesauce or, uh, you know, just think about that. Like think about what it's like when you have like a cold sore, a canker sore inside your mouth or a sore throat, right? Imagine that being the hole inside your mouth. What are you going to feel like eating? Probably not a lot, right? So we have a patient who's at risk for, um, nutrition, uh, decreased nutritional intake, right? Less calories than what their body needs, which by the way, they're already at risk for if you jump over the other column, nutrition, right? Because they're having a higher metabolic rate than the normal person uh, because cancer does that too. It increases your metabolic rate. So we need to make sure we're giving them foods that are appropriate for them. Uh, body image could be an issue. We can refer them to places for counseling. Um, there are various other different things that we can do to help improve body image uh, based on the specific needs of the patient, whether that's hair loss. I even forgot to, forgot to put alopecia on here. That's hair loss. Um, we could do wigs. We could do head wraps. We could do, you know, um, fake breasts, you know, like bras that have, um, make it look like you have breast implants or, or breast implants. There's a million different things that we can do to help improve someone's body image. Uh, uh, Anti-neoplastic therapy can also damage the nerves, uh, the nerve endings in the fingers and the toes and that kind of thing. Um, and a patient can develop neuropathy. Um, if you can't feel your feet when you get up to walk, it's very likely that you could fall, right? Or you might drop something if you can't feel your hands. Uh, so fall prevention strategies need to be taken into, uh, into account for these patients. Uh, of course, risk for infection, another type of cell that, um, uh, breaks down very, it turns over very quickly. I can't figure out the right word to use here, but reproduces, I guess, very quickly. Uh, our, 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 our cell, our um, blood cells, right? Like our white blood cells and our red blood cells, uh, those kinds of things. So we see patients who are at increased risk for infection and increased risk for bleeding. If we're knocking out all of those things, maybe someone's platelets are very low. It's going to put them at risk for bleeding. We need to keep them safe. If they fall, they could bleed to death right? If they get some kind of cut, they could bleed to death. So we want to make sure they're not brushing their teeth really, really hard. They already have mouth sores, potentially, right? But we also don't want them to start bleeding. Uh, we want to make sure that they um, maybe don't shave with a razor blade, right? Maybe they use an electric shaver because if they nick themselves, they could, could bleed. If they do have a fall um, where they hit their head, let's say they need to seek medical professional advice pretty quickly in case it turns into something more serious. With infection, one thing that we look at is a patient's absolute neutrophil count. Um, now, if you recall from our lecture about uh, in, uh, the immune system and infection, we talked about neutrophils. This is kind of like that army that's always circulating in your body. So if it's invaded by a bacteria, it's like, oh, look, there it is. Let's go get it, right? It's that army that's waiting to go. Um, if we knock out all of our neutrophils and our absolute neutrophil count gets really, really low, then we have no reserve. So if we're exposed to something very simple that most people could fight off because they have that neutrophil count there waiting for an attack, um, they could die from very uh, small infection. So um, we need to sometimes protect these patients. And I can't recall exactly the what the ANC needs to be to put a patient on what's called neutropenic precautions. Um, I don't expect you to know that specific value, but um, just understand that we may have to put a patient on neutropenic precautions, which would mean we are not concerned about spreading what they have to other people, more so as we're concerned about them getting some type of infection that's brought in by us. So when we do someone with um, 
neutropenic precautions, also called reverse isolation. Um, we wear a mask to protect them from getting sick. They don't get fresh fruit. Uh, they don't get, uh, are not allowed to have fresh flowers in their room. All of these things can potentially increase the risk for exposure to bacteria or fungus or various different things like that. So we have to protect um, uh, the patient limiting visitors. Um, and we can't restrict 100% on visitors, but we can try to limit them um, doing good hand hygiene, wearing masks, um, that kind of thing. Uh, mentioned nutrition, fatigue, you know, I mean, if you're someone who's normally a really up and at them kind of person, you like to go, 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 and then all of a sudden you just don't even have the energy to get out of bed, that can be really frustrating. So we can teach patients different techniques to manage their fatigue. Oftentimes people uh, feel more rested in the morning um, so maybe it's a good idea to encourage them to um, do the most important activities first thing in the morning um, because that's when they're going to have the most energy. Um, other things we can do for fatigue might be take breaks. You know, maybe it's okay to take a mid-afternoon nap and then get up and do some things later. Um, don't do all of the things at once, right? Maybe do a couple of the things. Um, maybe just do some of the dishes, maybe not all of the dishes, right? So just kind of rationing out the energy that you do have, um, using the energy to do that you do have to do the things that you want to do. Maybe having to ask for help from family members or friends or looking into getting assistance from like a home health care agency or help at home um, type program that can come in and help with things like housekeeping and, and bathing. Um, so lots of different things we can do. Someone just has absolutely no energy to get up and move around. Uh, pain is, it happens to patients who have cancer. Some, I have had some pa people with cancer not complain of pain, but most patients I know that have cancer have had pain. Um, whenever I have floated to our oncology unit, I give ungodly amounts of narcotic pain medications you have to remember people build up a tolerance to um, the medication. So it takes a more of a particular medication to achieve the desired effect. Um, so there's that, the opioids we can do. We can also implement non-pharmacological interventions, um, things like positioning or distraction, meditation, um, different exercises, massage, um, heat, ice. Um, it's very unique to the patient and the type of pain that they're having. Um, skin, uh, kind of going back to the mucositis, we can end up with skin sores, uh, things like that. And if we have an open area, that's a portal of entry for infection. So we need to make sure we're doing good skin care, keeping patients well hydrated, um, keeping their skin moist so it doesn't dry out, keeping them, keeping them well, keeping them well, nourished, well nourished. You know, good, healthy skin, keeping them clean, um, moving them around, turning, uh, relieving pressure off of skin, uh, various different things. So there's a lot of things we can do with that as well. Um, okay, oncologic emergencies. Um, there are a lot of them here. Your book goes through quite a few of them. You are more than welcome to look through them, get a better idea of what they're all about. I have put asterisks next to the ones that I would like you to have an idea about at this point in your education, mainly because they kind of tie into stuff we've either already talked about or will be talking about throughout the semester. So for example, sepsis. We have talked about sepsis when we talked about infection and how sepsis is on a spectrum um, of minor infection to septic shock. And when we have patients who are already at risk for developing infections, such as our patients with cancer, this is a, something um, that we have to be uh, aware of and monitoring our patients for. It can occur quite quickly. Um, so we need to keep them uh, free from infection. If they do develop an infection, then we need to be aggressively treating them and monitoring them for the complication of sepsis, right? So looking at things like um, blood pressure, heart rate, temperature, white blood cells, um, 
you know, all those different things that we kind of look at screening, uh, screening them, giving them fluids, antibiotics, uh, whatnot. Um, SIADH is syn syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. We don't really talk a whole lot in MedSurge 1 about um, this hormonal aspect or endocrine aspect. You get more information about that in um, MedSurge 2. So I'm not going to go a whole lot into SIADH with you. You'll hear more about that probably next semester. Um, but this can lead to hyponatremia, which is something um, that we talk about. So that's how that is uh, pertinent here. Hypercalcemia is another, um, another occurrence that we'll talk about later in the semester when we talk about calcium. I think we cover that when we talk about mobility. Uh, but oftentimes tumors will secrete a parathyroid-like hormone. And when we get to calcium, you'll learn that parathyroid hormone causes calcium to move from the bones into the bloodstream leading to an elevated serum calcium level. Um, and so that, that's where we get that hypercalcemia from. Um, let's see, tumor. Lysis syndrome. Let me see if there's anything I want to say about hypercalcemia really quickly first. Uh, oh, yes, I should probably tell you. Um, skeletal pain, abdominal pain, um, alterations in cognition, fatigue, poor appetite, and decreased deep tendon reflexes. Just something good to kind of have an idea about. Let's see, I told you SIADH. Uh, okay, tumor lysis syndrome. Um, this one is actually kind of a good sign. What is happening here with tumor lysis syndrome is we have a high amount of cell kill, cell death. Um, and when all of those cells die, the contents of the cell spills out into the bloodstream. Um, now we haven't talked about potassium yet, but when we do, right, you'll learn that potassium is the most abundant intracellular ion. And so if you think of it like that, when all of these cells die and their contents spill out into the blood, we have this huge release of potassium, as well as a huge release of uric acid from those cells that have died. Um, so our patient is going to experience signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia. Um, most importantly, little preview here, most importantly, um, hyperkalemia can lead to deadly arrhythmias. We start to see things like peaked T waves, um, palpitations, tachycardia, chest pain. We can get a widening of the QRS and we could ultimately lead in to a rhythm that's going to need to be shockable or cardioverted or something of that kind of nature. So um, if that's something that we're seeing, while it is good, right, it means that we're having a death of a lot of cells, we're going to really need to dilute out that patient. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. That's the best way that we can prevent this. It's more common when we're dealing with a cancer that's fast growing. Um, those cells tend to die very quickly. So if we think that our patient's at risk for that, we really need to keep them hydrated. Two, three, four liters of fluid uh, in, a, in, a, in a day, they're on that higher end. Um, that's going to help with that um, hyper hyperkalemia. Maybe we need to put them on a monitor, um, watch their cardiac rhythm. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into hyperkalemia because I don't want to give it all away for a future lecture, um, but just uh, that's kind of the basics of uh, of that. Um, I believe that that is the end of the slideshow. So uh, that's all we're going to talk about with cancer. Uh, I hope that wasn't too, too, too much. Um, you will have an assignment related to the content of cancer, um, but as this time it's completely asynchronous, there's no live lecture for this. You should be able to view this uh, independently at your leisure, as well as do your assignment on your own time as long as it's done by the due date. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, because you know, the next task on the list after cancer is our first test, hopefully we will be back uh, in school. Fingers crossed, right? Uh, I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. Um, but until then, that is all that I have for you for now. So have a good rest of your day.